Hi everyone and welcome to Investing Strategies. It's Alyssa Quorum with Investors Business Daily from the NASDAQ market site in Times Square. On this week's show, we're breaking down the market's latest whipsaw action. The chief investment strategist at William O'Neill & Company is here to share his Q4 market outlook and will analyze several compelling names on his radar. Plus, we're sitting down with Innovator Capital to learn more about their newly expanded suite of defined outcome ETFs. And the COO and CFO of MongoDB is here to talk about the high growth software company's path to profitability. Investing strategy starts now. All right, let's begin with this week's market insights. Wild swings have defined October's market action so far, but should investors expect that volatility to continue through the end of the year? Joining me for today's discussion is Randy Watts, Chief Investment Strategist at William O'Neill & Company and affiliate of Investors Business Daily. Thanks so much for joining me today, Randy. Thanks for having me back again. All right, so I think all eyes are really focused on these trade talks this week, um, but I guess putting it in the broader context of the quarter, it seems like it could be a pretty pivotal week uh, to set the tone for the next couple months, perhaps. Sure. So there's there's kind of two important events this week. The first is, as you mentioned, there's trade talks in D.C. between the China delegation and the U.S. Uh, over the weekend, uh, news came out that the Chinese are going to be taking a harder line on a couple of items. Uh, that includes not rolling back uh, government subsidies or industrial policy. So they're trying to really narrow the scope of things they'll talk about or negotiate on in the trade deal. And those trade talks really get going this Thursday. So it'll be interesting to see if anything positive comes out of that. Obviously, the market really wants positive news on the trade front because it's, it's really kind of freezing business spending right here. Uh, the second thing that's important this week is also on Thursday, we're going to get U.S. inflation data. And I think that'll give investors a sense of how much wiggle room there is for the Fed to keep cutting rates as we go through the year. Right. It does seem like the market is hypersensitive to headlines, both positive and negative right now. So could be some market moving headlines to come. But let's take a look at the technicals. Sure. Um, when you're looking at the NASDAQ, I mean, last week was uh, one of the wilder weeks in a while. And that says something because it's been a, a pretty volatile last few months. You know, the technical picture on the market doesn't look great right now. Right now we have the market rated downtrend. Uh, the ear earliest we could have a potential follow through day is later this week. Uh, I would say there's, there's kind of two things to note there. The first is the market has tried to go to new highs several times this year and has basically failed two or three times and then come back down through the 50 day. Right now we're trading right around the 50 day moving average. Uh, so the technical action is not great market's been chopping around without any strong positive direction. The second thing is on individual stocks and sectors. Right now, the only sector out of the 11 O'Neill sectors that's meaningfully above its 50-day moving average is utilities, which is a very defensive group. So we don't like the sector action. On the individual stock basis, if you go back two weeks ago or so, about 75% of S&P stocks were trading above their 50-day. Right now, that number is about 50%. So that, that's also not a good, a good metric. Normally when the market's really humming, you have 60% or more of S&P stocks above their 50. Right, and we do know that earnings uh, can often be a really big catalyst for a lot of individual stocks. So with earnings season just around the corner once again, what is your outlook for what we could see um, in that perspective in the market? Sure, so earnings season uh, kicks off really next Tuesday. It's when the big banks start to report. The big banks are really the first reporters every earnings season. Uh, and this earnings season probably is going to really affect the market. One of the things that's troubling with earnings is right now the median company in the S&P is forecasted to grow earnings this coming quarter, or this, this reported quarter, by about 3%. That'll be the slowest number if it comes out that way since Q4 of 2015. Uh, the other thing that's problematic is estimates have been coming down for the last four quarters. So for each of the last four quarters, when we've gotten into earnings season, the 12-month forward earnings number has fallen. And I just think it's very hard for the market to really get its feet under it with, if forward estimates keep falling. So those negative revisions have really happened in every sector, with the exception of utilities, again, over the last 60 and 90 days. Right. Well, with all that in mind, let's pivot to this week's stocks to watch. Given the volatility, we want to take a look at a couple of names that are uh, on the steady side, but have made pretty big moves this year. So we're going to start off with Zoetis. And Zoetis is going to issue its earnings in, in about a month from now. So we still right. have a little bit of time before that earnings report comes in. But the technical action here has been very strong. Yeah, I mean, the reason we like this stock and also 
also like the other stock we're about to talk about, is the fact that we're really looking for companies right now that have something that's fundamentally driving their product set that's kind of immune or less affected by the global macro situation. So as you said, Zoetis is the world's largest animal health company. They make medicines, they make vaccines, they make diagnostic tests, et cetera. It's about a $60 billion market cap company. Uh, they operate in over 100 countries. They've been able to grow their top line in the high single digits, which is, which is very strong and steady. And what we really like about the stock right now is that they have a big new product coming out that's scheduled to be launched in the first quarter of next year, and it's called Symparica. And this is a drug uh, for pets that, that, that helps treat fleas, ticks, and heartworm. We think this drug has the potential to be a $4 billion type product. That's the addressable market for it. So we think that can really help accelerate earnings next year. Also, the company's business has been very strong the last couple of quarters. On the previously reported quarter, it was a beat and raise quarter. So there's a lot of positive business momentum that the company's driving right now. And again, it's really company specific as opposed to something that's very cyclical. Right, uh, and especially key to look at uh, some of these factors that could hold up given some of the broader macro issues that we're seeing right now. And we also want to take a look at American Tower. And normally growth investors aren't really focused on REITs, but uh, when you look at how American American Tower is acting, it looks, it's trading like a growth stock. A absolutely. REITs, like utilities, have been one of the better groups in the market over the last year. Uh, American Tower has a dividend yield of about 1.68%. That's obviously above the U.S. 10-year yield right now, which is about 1.53. And it's a, it's a, it's a decent-sized company. It's got a $100 billion market cap. And what we like about American Tower is they're the leader in communication sites around the globe. They have about 171,000 sites, of which uh, 41,000 of those are in the U.S., 130,000 are international. And what's really driving their business is the rollout of 5G, which is the new wireless technology for voice and data. Uh, that rollout's happening globally. It's really driven by mobile data usage. Globally, mobile, mobile data usage is growing about 30 to 40 percent a year. So there's a real demand by the carriers, who are American Towers customers, to roll out this technology to help their, their kind of overburdened networks. Uh, and because of that, we think, much like Zoetis, this company can grow its revenues in the high single digits the next couple of years, have strong earnings growth, and I think is really uh, also a little buffered between the macro economy, because I think this rollout is going to happen globally, whether the economy is weak for a year or not. Right, and given that we are still really early in the rollout, uh, this is going to this is a story that's going to play out over the next several years, so um, a big new story here for American Tower coming uh, coming up? Absolutely. Really, the 5G rollout is really starting this year. The U.S. is a, is ahead of some countries there. And over the next really, you know, three to five years, this is really going to spread all around the globe. So we think their prospects look very strong. All right. Well, we'll definitely keep an eye on it. Thank you so much, Randy, for Thank your you. insights today. And after the break, we're going to sit down with Innovator Capital Management to learn more about their newly expanded suite of defined outcome ETFs. Back in a minute. Leaderboard helps you invest better with winning stocks picked by our team of experts. Select a stock to see current analysis. Check the chart for buy and sell points, plus get real-time price alerts. Improve your investing with Leaderboard. Start your free trial today. Outcome ETFs are still relatively new, but their traction is notable. And now the growing category is getting even bigger with NASDAQ 100 and Russell 2000 buffer funds from Innovator Capital Management, which is IBD's ETF partner. And joining me now to discuss their defined outcome funds is Graham Day, Vice President of Product Development and Research at Innovator. Thanks so much for being here today, Graham. Thanks, Sally. All right, so this defined outcome category still relatively new. So before we dive into the specifics uh, of the new offerings, let's just kind of outline for our audience what exactly they're getting with a defined outcome ETF. Sure. Now, the, the interesting thing is defined outcome investing isn't necessarily new in of, of itself. Uh, this type of investing has been around for decades, but it's been around in other product structures 
whether it's an insurance product or, or a bank product. And this is the first time we've introduced it in the ETF wrapper. Now, defined outcome investing is pretty, pretty simple. We take a well-known benchmark like the S&P 500, like the NASDAQ 100, and give investors one-for-one -one upside exposure to that up to a cap, and then we provide a downside buffer that's built in. And, and so that's something that we think is incredibly valuable today, given there's increased market volatility. We're at the end of maybe a 10-year bull, uh, bull run, and investors aren't necessarily looking to take on that full market risk. They want to remain invested, but they also want to know that they've got maybe a downside buffer should the market sell off. Right, so let's talk a little more about that downside buffer. So there's a predefined risk uh, heading into this. So there's different buffer levels for yes. some of these. So what exactly does that mean for someone getting into this product? Sure, so uh, we have three different buffer, le buffer levels. The first is a 9% buffer level that will um, buffer investors for the first 9% of losses experienced by the index. The second is a 15% buffer. And the third is a, actually a 30% buffer. And that one's a little different. It, it operates from negative 5% to negative uh, 35%. And what that allows is an investor to uh, say that they're not sure where the equity markets are gonna end up one year from now, that they're able to participate in the market. And if the market goes up five, six, 10%, uh, they can participate one for one with that. Now, if the market goes up 20%, there's an upside cap. So you're trading some of your upside potential for that known downside buffer. But as I mentioned, people aren't expecting the equity markets to give 15, 16% a year like they have over the last 10 years. And so if they can get 10% a year and have a downside buffer, we think this is a, a timely uh, investment opportunity for them. And then uh, on the upside, how are those caps determined? Because uh, you know, there's a, there's a little yeah. bit of a calculation that um, hits, I guess, on a monthly or quarterly basis, depending on how often these are rolling out. Yeah, absolutely. And so there's really what we do at Innovator is we try to pass on the highest cap possible to the end investor, and so we give whatever the market is giving us. And so the factors that go into the cap are market volatility, interest rates, and dividend yield. Those are really the main three factors that determine uh, upside caps. The higher the volatility, the higher the interest rates, the higher the dividend yield, the higher our upside cap will be and vice versa. All right, and then I guess the, the other thing to discuss too would be the time horizon with this because uh, whereas a lot of ETFs, you can trade them like stocks, but with this one, uh, there's a time element involved. There is, and what's unique about these and, and definitely compared to the other product structures you might see defined outcome ETFs or defined outcome investing offered in is, as you mentioned, these are one year outcome periods. Now, if you buy at the beginning of the outcome period, uh, you have a one year investment horizon. You have a known upside cap, you have a known downside buffer. But what's different about these ETFs is that six months in, the markets have moved, the ETFs have moved. However, you are still owning those same basket of options that we bought six months ago. So if you're looking at our ETFs six months after we issue the product, you now have a six month outcome period, you have a different cap, you have a different buffer, but they're all known to you before you invest. And that's something that uh, advisors find incredibly valuable, that they can buy one of our products in its outcome period and still know exactly what they're going to get out of that. Right, well, uh, as you mentioned, this market is very volatile, and uh, in the past several weeks, we've primarily seen that volatility to the downside. So uh, someone who is in one of these products, how does it work in terms of, uh, if you do have that downside buffer, how, how are, how's that being settled every, every month? Yeah, so the, uh, the options that we hold are over one year, and given that we are buying options on the largest, most liquid benchmark indices out there, the NASDAQ 100, Russell 2000, S&P 500, MSCI Emerging Markets, that's where all the liquidity is. And because of that, uh, these options essentially have value assigned to them every single day, no different than a stock or an ETF that holds uh, uh, stocks uh, itself. Those, that value is going to be represented in the value of the ETF. And so because of that, 
advisors can buy and sell these ETFs with confidence knowing they're going to get the full value that those options are representing. All right, and so we have the new products that just launched in uh, October with the NASDAQ 100 and Russell 2000 uh, defined outcome ETFs. So uh, there's a wide array now uh, of options for people yeah. uh, when it comes to the defined outcome choices that they have. Yeah, now, as you mentioned, with the Russell 2000, NASDAQ 100, mentioned that we have the MSCI Emerging Markets, IFA, S&P 500. We feel like we've provided the tools now for advisors to build really a globally allocated, buffered portfolio. Again, the idea isn't to outperform the market, and it's very challenging to do that, but if you can provide beta market exposure uh, up to a cap, but have that downside buffer, given where we're at in the market cycle, that's where we see a lot of people um, looking to allocate. A lot of capital focus on capital preservation, limiting downside losses. These tools are perfect for those types of investors. All right. Uh, so last but not least, can you just uh, tell us a little bit more about uh, what's in store for Innovator in terms of now we have a lot of these monthly issuances and uh, the different indexes that are being tracked. What's next? Yeah, so we're going to continue to look for new types of payoffs on these benchmark uh, indices. But as you point out, what's unique about these is we're not just bringing out one product on the S&P 500. We're bringing out a series of products. On the S&P 500, we're bringing them out on a monthly basis. Why are we doing that? We're doing that because advisors want to be able to get in at the beginning of the outcome period and just know exactly that they've got a fresh downside buffer, they've got a fresh upside cap. And it also provides more, we'll call them tactical opportunities for advisors to take advantage of um, when they're accessing these products. And so uh, bringing these on a monthly basis for the S&P and then a quarterly, uh, on a quarterly basis for a number of the other uh, indices. Right, I think tactical is a really great word to describe it because you know ETFs can of course be used for long-term buy and hold, but we are seeing more tactical applications as well. So thank you so much for helping us learn more about these defined outcome ETFs today. Right. Thanks, Ali. All right, and coming up next, we're getting technical with some stock charts. I'll be walking you through how to track the life cycle of a stock. We'll be right back. Pick winning stocks with MarketSmith. Growth 250 shows you ideas with big potential. View charts packed with key data. Use pattern recognition to see action zones. MarketSmith by Investors Business Daily. Try three weeks for $19.95. All stocks have a life cycle, and it's very important for investors to take a step back and know what stage in that life cycle a stock is experiencing. Even the fastest growing names can't go up forever, but even when a once explosive stock rolls over, that doesn't mean it can't have another big run after taking a breather. So for this week's case study, let's take a look at the chart of database software stock MongoDB. MongoDB went public in October 2017, and by the following spring, the stock had broken out of an IPO base. Now, we've talked before about how the IPO base has proven to be the launching pad of the first big moves of many top growth stocks. MongoDB provided multiple other buying opportunities for investors to get in along this run. And by June 2019, shares ultimately gained as much as 670% from the IPO price of 24. Now, since then, this is a weekly chart here, MongoDB shares have sold off with the broader software sector after a huge group move. But even though the stock recently dipped below its 40-week moving average, marking a sell signal for long-term shareholders, that doesn't mean it can't turn around and launch another big move. Profitability or another new development in MongoDB's story could unlock the stock's next phase of growth. And now let's take a look at a historical example of a stock that launched another big move after its chart suffered some technical damage. And that's Booking.com. Now, Booking came out of the other side of the 2008 financial crisis with a big run, going from $70 a share near the end of 2008 all the way up to about $274 by spring 2010. Then, shares sold off roughly 38% over the next few months, but that sell-off created another opportunity for investors to get in. Now, investors who bought booking stock out of this consolidation here enjoyed a 100% price gain over the next nine months. There are other periods in booking's history where the stock pulled back or moved sideways for long periods before making a new leg higher. 
And Booking.com is just one of many examples of this. But as you can see, with the biggest winners, even if you miss earlier moves, you can still capitalize on massive runs after a stock takes a breather and experiences a period of declines. All right, well, the reason why we wanted to talk about MongoDB specifically this week is because we're about to sit down with MongoDB's CFO to learn about the software company's growth trajectory and its path to profitability. That's happening right after the break. This season on Cultural Capital, we are in New York City and San Francisco. Come with me as I tour some of the world's most innovative companies, from Squarespace to C3AI, Giphy, and Figma. Learn how CEOs built growing companies while maintaining the ultimate office culture on season three of Cultural Capital on the brand new Nasdaq.com. Well, the software sector has no doubt produced some of the fastest growing companies in the market, and we're likely still in the early innings of that growth. Here with me now is Michael Gordon, the COO and CFO of database software company MongoDB. Thank you so much for being here today, Michael. Oh, thanks for having me. All right, so tell me a little bit about MongoDB in terms of, I guess, giving the audience the background. Uh, the stock itself has been on just such an incredible run since the company has gone public. Uh, and MongoDB has a really impressive track record of very strong sales growth. What do you think makes MongoDB stand out in terms of being able to uh, churn in that impressive top line growth? Sure, sure. Well, like I said, thanks for having me. Um, maybe it's a little bit helpful to put the database market in context. I think for some people it's, it's hard to understand, and so we'll try and give a quick summary before we talk about all the details. Um, so um, today, you've heard these phrases like software is eating the world, or every company trying to become a software company or a technology company. And at the root of that is the idea that companies are increasingly competing for customers on the basis of their technology, right? It's the user experience that you have, um, the applications that you're interacting with, those are driving who's winning in the marketplace. And the database comes in because the database is at the heart of every software application, right? That's why we occupy this incredibly strategic uh, spot within the market. It's also one of the largest markets in all of software. So the database market is estimated to be $64 billion today, growing to $98 billion in 2023. Uh, so I think that highlights that it's, it's such an important market. Um, the market though is also ripe for disruption, right? The industry leaders, um, it's dominated by legacy technology and legacy players. Uh, and the leaders in the industry are using technology that was pioneered more than 40 years ago. Uh, so imagine this is technology that was built before the cloud, before mobile, uh, before social, things like that. And what we've come up with at MongoDB is a better modern alternative. So we're the leading modern uh, alternative, uh, and you can see those results in our popularity. We now have more than 15,000 customers using MongoDB, uh, and in our last quarter, our second quarter as a public company, we reported just under $100 million in revenue in the quarter. All right, uh, so let's talk a little bit about some of the applications then, uh, because we know that every company now is really trying to harness their data and uh, you know, glean actionable insights from that. So can you give us a sense of what uh, MongoDB does in action? Sure, yeah. Um, uh, and the database usually isn't something you touch and feel, right? But you experience it and you interact with it through all the applications that you use. So there are applications that are customer facing, uh, that drive revenue for customers, there are back office applications. Uh, it's really just an incredible wide range uh, of applications that you'll see, which is the reason that we're the leading modern general purpose database. Um, and you see that with mission critical applications um, that are billing utility, you know, billing applications for uh, large global utilities, uh, trading applications on Wall Street, uh, but also new startups that have built the entirety of their business uh, on MongoDB. Right, and you mentioned um, that there are some legacy players in this space and how it's really ripe for disruption. Can you talk about, uh, I guess, the symbiosis that's needed uh, between uh, how you're partnering with uh, some of these other players in the market, yet also how it's competition for you guys? Yeah, sure, so the market is interesting. It's different than a lot in software. Some of the markets in software tend to be more monolithic, right? If you think about someone's ERP software or their uh, HR software, one organization would only 
run you know, one piece of HR software. You know, the marketing department isn't on a different piece of uh, HR software than the legal department. Uh, databases are different, right? A, a large application can have tens or hundreds of thousands uh, of applications in a large organization, and each one has their own database. And so you'll see um, you know, MongoDB uh, sitting alongside or replacing legacy technology like Oracle and others, uh, but also having to run alongside it, right? Because someone's not going to change out every single application uh, all at once. And so you see that sort of competition, uh, for sure, for both existing workloads uh, and new workloads, but also uh, companies supporting a couple of core database technologies, uh, of which we're, we're one. Right, and uh, given that this is still being rolled out for uh, a lot of companies, uh, can you tell me a little bit about how you expect uh, the, the growth clip to keep continuing with this? Are we still really early? Yeah, so I think we're, we're very early on in the growth. We have an incredibly small market share relative to the size of the opportunity that we're going after. Uh, one of the big drivers, not only is the innovation, uh, but we've also seen a lot of companies moving to consuming uh, software as a service, uh, and particularly in the cloud offering. So our fastest growing product is called MongoDB Atlas, and that's a database as a service offering. And so rather than having to worry about managing the infrastructure and sort of the plumbing and backup and restores and some of the more complicated things, um, this lets you just build your applications. Right? You don't have to worry about the undifferentiated heavy lifting uh, of building the actual application. Uh, you just get to go spend more of your time and more of your developer cycles focus on building great user experiences uh, and building great applications. And so we've seen that uh, become our fastest growing product. The whole portfolio is growing quite quickly, uh, but MongoDB Atlas is, is, is growing very rapidly. And one of the sector tailwinds that we benefit with that is the fact that large enterprises are starting to migrate and move workloads to the cloud. Uh, and so that continues to be one of the many growth drivers. Right, uh, so with all of these growth drivers in mind then, MongoDB is still a young public company. Can you tell us a bit about the path to profitability for MongoDB because uh, our audience is definitely very focused on what could potentially be the next catalyst, so to speak, for the stock. Sure, yeah, so we're coming up on our two year anniversary in October of life as a public company. So we've got eight sort of publicly recorded uh, quarters. And what we've seen over the last couple of years, uh, to your point, is we've seen you know, continued losses, but diminishing losses as a percent of revenue. We've, we've delivered that sort of progress, if you will. Uh, and we think about it uh, in the context of response growth, and I, I mean that in two ways. I mean that in the, the probably more obvious or traditional way where it's not growth at all costs, right? We're not trying to just describe growth for the sake of growth. We're really focused on the underlying uh, economics and unit economics of the investments that we're making. Um, and we're doing that in the context of seeing these sort of winnowing or shrinking losses as a percentage. Uh, at the same time, it's also responsible growth in the sense of it's very responsible given the size of our market and the strength of our product market fit and the very high returns we're seeing on both investments in sales and marketing and in research and development that we should be continuing to grow for the long term. So we're trying to sort of balance those two things uh, and ultimately I think you see that playing out in the results. All right, well thank you so much for sitting down with us today. Loved learning more about MongoDB. Uh, we'll definitely keep tabs on what you guys are doing in the enterprise software space. Great, thanks so much for having me. All right, and thank you all for watching Investing Strategies. We'll see you right back here for our show next Monday. Until then, I'm Alyssa Corum.